speak about the labels and security theory. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to also thank uh, Juven for, for organizing uh, such nice talk so far, um, and it's a pleasure to, to be here. Of course, I'm, I'm local, but I get to uh, tell you about this nice work with, with uh, Zohar Komarvatsky, who's at Simon Center, and Itamar Hassan, which is he's a grad student at Tel Aviv University. And uh, I'd say, work in progress. I gave up on saying to appear on this project because um, Ironing out all the kinks has been quite a, quite a challenge, but I do think it's, uh, it's almost done. You should see a paper in a couple weeks or so. Okay. So, the topic is spontaneous symmetry breaking. So, the, the basics of spontaneous symmetry breaking are to note that we can have a potential which, for example, this potential. By the way, here from Taylor, we University, we have some funding that help people to come from. Oh, yeah? Yeah, from ECO. Okay, then maybe we can get him to visit. We should talk about it. Um, right, so spontaneous symmetry breaking is uh, enabled by the possibility of having a potential which is symmetric. So in this case, we have this typical uh, this, uh, Lando Ginsburg potential here, and a symmetry phi goes to minus phi, but there's no symmetric minimum. So if the system likes to settle in its minimum, even though the dynamics are symmetric, there is no symmetric ground state. The system is just as happy being here or here. And to be here rather than here, you have to break the symmetry. Now, in a quantum mechanical system, the solution to this is that it settles into a superposition of this minimum plus this minimum. And the state that's this minimum minus this minimum is another eigenstate of slight higher energy. But in a quantum field theory in a many body system where phi is some function of space as well as time, we can actually have, uh, we can forbid quantum tunneling by having a large system size. And an interesting thing to consider in this case is the domain wall. So if we impose boundary conditions, for instance, we impose the field to be in the green minimum here and the orange minimum here, these boundary conditions are frustrated and the ground state includes a domain wall. So the main wall has some energy cost where the field has to make its way over the mustache here. But uh, it is nonetheless the lowest energy state to just have a straight domain wall here. There is a, there's a zero mode, there's equal energy where you put the domain wall. But there's also Goldstone modes um, of the broken translation invariance. And those Goldstone modes correspond to fluctuations of the location of this domain wall. And they're massless. Their stiffness is set by the potential and the stiffness of the field phi, which is called the order parameter. And the question is, can we get anything else on the domain wall? So there is one possibility one can imagine, which is that uh, these two regions are in different SPT phases. So an SPT phase is a phase with a unique ground state um, that supports edge modes. So if these are in different SPT states, then we expect some extra gapless degrees of freedom along the wall. But of course, this picture is a little bit, uh, it has some tension with the Z2 symmetry because these, uh, these ground states are, so, are supposed to be indistinguishable from each other. And we might just as well imagine that we have the opposite situation where the SPT is on this <coughs> side, the trivial state on this side. It's not really a good way to assign the phase to either side at best, we can say that their difference is some um, SPT phase. And here, I've assumed it's an SPT for some unbroken symmetry G. So because the Z2 symmetry has to map this vacuum to this vacuum, it means that it acts as a SPT tangler. I believe what that is. So um, roughly speaking, a GSPT, or a symmetry protected topological phase, is a state which may only be connected to a trivial, meaning a product state, by a quantum circuit which globally commutes with G. So here's your quantum circuit. It uh, commutes with the global symmetry action, but not locally, meaning that these circuit elements, these, these small unitaries, don't individually commute with the group. So any, any such circuit that does this, that takes you from the product state to the SPT state, uh, we call an entangler for this SPT state. And this is exactly what the Z2 symmetry is doing, right? So the Z2 symmetry is um, 
acting on this vacuum and taking it to this vacuum, and in doing so, it has to create some entanglement. So it has to it has to act a bit non-locally. Um, so if this is the picture for where G acts on site, so we learned that if uh, if G acts on site, then the Z2 symmetry, which we have broken, uh, cannot act on site, and this this likely indicates a mixed anomaly between G and Z2. I have to tell you what an anomaly is. So, uh, an anomaly is a global symmetry, or an anomaly of a global symmetry, is uh, one which cannot be made local, so it either cannot be gauged or is not realized in the lattice model as an on site symmetry, um, but it can be done so at the boundary of some SPT phase. And so, our picture of this uh, symmetry breaking domain wall, where the two the two sides were in opposite SPT states, this actually can be uh, made a lot more boring looking if it's the boundary of an SPT phase in one larger dimension, where the symmetry breaking now extends from the boundary into the bulk, and on the domain wall of the bulk, you have some GSPT, and then the edge mode here is associated to that GSPT. So rather than uh, trying to assign the SPT to this minimum or this minimum, we don't have to choose. We can just say it's associated to this, uh, this extra wall that's uh, coming from this bulk SPT. So this is a picture of a uh, certain class of C2 times G anomalies. Um, it leads to these uh, decorated domain wall constructions, which are nice ways of constructing SPT phases out of lower dimensional ones. Uh, it also gives us a picture of the anomaly associated to the SPT phase transition. So when we go out of the SPT phase, you can kind of imagine that these domain walls are fluctuating and, and sort of like an icing criticality type picture. And we go eventually from the trivial phase to the SPT phase. Okay, but in this talk, our interest is in using the domain wall to compute the anomaly. So the hope is that one can disorder the system completely away from the domain wall find some degrees of freedom off the domain wall, and study those to determine what the anomaly is, thereby reducing the dimension of an otherwise pretty hard calculation. Okay, so already this picture assumes some things about that anomaly. For instance, uh, if there's a pure G anomaly, then it's not possible to uh, create a feature of state over here or by the orange smiley or by the green one, um, because we would have to break the G symmetry to do so. That's a that's a property of the anomaly. You have to you have to break the symmetry to get a featureless state. So this picture already assumes there's no uh, pure G anomaly. On the other hand, it certainly captures some mixed G times Z2 anomaly. And we could also ask, what what about like a pure Z2 anomaly? It seems like there's no there's no Z2 symmetry anymore on the domain wall. So how do we consider a, like a pure Z2 anomaly, or a, even a more complicated mixed anomaly? We're going to try to answer these questions. Excuse me. Is the domain wall here gapless yeah, so yeah. gap? Well, it doesn't matter. So um, in this talk, it'll it'll be the gapless because it'll be it'll be one plus one dimension. Um, we want to have a symmetric state on the domain wall in, in a way that I'll explain. But in higher dimensions, we're doing a, we're doing a three plus one d anomaly calculation. You might find a symmetric d of d on the domain wall, and then uh, we will our results will give you some anomaly matching conditions for those as well. And another question is that uh, you mentioned the relation between one dollar dimensional domain wall and the phase transition on its own dimension. <coughs> is this relation? Uh, do you know the, the sharp statement for this relation? No, I think it's it's more like an intuitive statement. I mean, there are some models where you can see this happen. Um, uh, there is there is a statement that says that if you have a GSPT whose uh, degree is order two, then the transition between that and the trivial state uh, has to enjoy the angular as symmetry. So you can say that it has a mixed model, and that anomaly needs to be satisfied by a first order or a space transition. There have been some interesting works about this that I can point you to after. Any other questions? This is, the, this is what we might attempt to do. And is 
this Z2 here unitary, anti unitary? Or? It's about to be anti unitary. Can it be anything? Okay. So, the, the example I want to uh, explain in some detail is this massless uh, Majorana fermion in two proton dimensions. So, this, uh, this is a two component real fermion. It has a time reversal symmetry, which uh, is an anti unitary symmetry and acts on the field this way, where gamma zero is uh, this pi times the poly matrix y. So it's a real matrix that squares to minus one. Time reversal itself thus squares to minus one on the fermion. And uh, we're working at Lorentz signature for this talk. At least until we get to, yeah, we're working at Lorentz signature right now. And this this theory, so here is the here's the massless kinetic term. If we add a mass, then we get a, we get a featureless state, a gap state with the unique ground state. But of course, uh, this breaks time reversal symmetry, and this is a symptom of a time reversal symmetry anomaly of this theory, which has been studied in a lot of detail. It's very interesting. Um, its its degree is 16. The degree of the anomaly means that. If you have a system with an anomaly and you take some number of copies of it, what is the smallest number of copies you need to take so that there is a symmetric interaction that can trivially gap the entire thing? So for this Majorana, it turns out you need to take 16 of them, and there's a special interaction among 16 uh, Majoranas of this dimension, which creates a uh, featureless state. Of course, that only the construction of such an interaction only proves that the order of the anomaly divides 16. It might be say, order eight or something, and we just haven't been clever enough to uh, construct the interaction among eight Majorana fermions. Of course, uh, we know now that uh, the order is actually sixteen, and you can you can reason through that by uh, some index theory that um, that Witten did in this nice paper on the parity and all two plus one dimensions. But we're going to try to do this uh, uh, much easier by reducing the dimension. Okay, so the mass the mass term is not uh, symmetric, but it's a good idea to have it anyway uh, by promoting it to a field. So this so-called Spurion analysis. So we introduce a scalar field called Spurion, who which is odd under time reversal. So the side will transform in the same way, and we'll just have some some basic. Uh, uh, terms for this scalar, so typical kinetic term, some potential. That's going to be the potential that I wrote before a bit. And we have this uh, Yukawa interaction, which says that when phi gets an expectation value, it acts as a mass term for the fermion. Okay, so this theory has the same anomaly as the theory without the scalar, because the anomaly is preserved by all symmetric deformations. And Without breaking time reversal symmetry, a mass term for phi, which is just phi squared, is uh, T symmetric. And so if you just give that a really large parameter, you can integrate out phi, and we're back to the theory of the three fermions. Okay, so now, of course, we want to create the domain wall. We create the domain wall by, instead of giving phi a large positive mass squared, we give it a large <coughs> negative mass squared, and then some phi before term. And that will cause phi to uh, settle very deeply into a non-zero minimum. There will be two minima because of the symmetry. And so I told you it's in one minimum, so it obtains an expectation value. And that acts as an effective mass for the Majorana fermion. So if we have this domain wall, one of the one of the minima is going to be a positive mass for the fermion, and the other minimum is going to be a negative mass. And along the domain wall, this mass is going to be, this effective mass is going to be changing sign. And so, uh, famously, this problem where you study a, a mass domain wall for the for the fermion carries, you find a chiral 1D fermion on the wall. So there's a chirality here, where the mass goes from plus to minus, and the fermion travels only this direction. It went from minus to plus, it would travel the other direction. Okay, there's no way to get rid of this mode. You can't write a mass term for a single chiral fermion. And it's, uh, it's also a symptom of the anomaly. It's, uh, in fact, it is an anomaly of this 1D theory, this 1 plus 1D theory. It's a so-called gravitational anomaly, because if you try to write a partition function for a chiral fermion, you'll find that it, uh, it depends on extra details of the manifold, such as the framing. 
Okay, so this is intuitively another symptom of the anomaly, and it kind of tells us that the anomaly is at least uh, order <coughs> two, right? Because, uh, well, sorry, I'll get that. So we want to, we want to get ahead of myself. So we want to know the order of the anomaly. Um, so we're going to ask how many copies of this uh, picture do we need to take before we can get rid of the domain wall? Make it just like only the gold stone, but it's on the domain wall again. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so we take n copies of what we just did. Well, at least at least n flavors of the Majoranas. We still have just one scalar. We'll have them all coupled to the, to the scalar in the same way. And so you just get n copies of this mass domain wall problem. So for each of the n uh, two-dimensional fermions, you get one uh, chiral 1D fermion on the wall. So there are n chiral 1D fermions all moving in the same direction. And you can't get rid of those either for any n. So these have a gravitational anomaly, uh, which is an integer value, which is just given roughly by the chiral central charge. And so you can't get rid of them for any end. There's no term you can write down. Um, does this mean that the time reversal anomaly is infinite order? Well, of course, the answer is no. Um, and the first lesson to get from that is that uh, the original anomaly, which we know a priori is Z-mod 16, does not determine the anomaly on the wall. Because there's no there's no surjective math to Z mod 16 to Z. Okay, so that's that's the first lesson. It's already an interesting one. Let me give you a uh, another you know another example to illustrate this, which is that we take two Majoranas, except now the scalar couples to each of the Majoranas by the opposite sign. So one of them is like phi side bar side, the other one's minus phi side bar side. So because of this. The effective masses are have opposite signs in two regions. So one of the effective mass of one fermion is going from positive to negative, the other one is going from negative to positive, which means that one of them contributes a non-chiral a chiral going this way, the other one contributes a chiral going that way. So the sign changes of the effective masses. Um, they go in opposite directions, so we have a non-chiral mode on the wall. So it looks like you just write a mass term for this non chiral mode. There's no gravitational anomaly anymore. So now we wonder is the anomaly actually just order two? Right. Can you just say that this is invertible as opposed to order two? This just means we can cancel the anomaly. Yeah, well, it means that uh, we took two copies of the system and we trivialized it by trivializing the domain. Outside. Yeah, order two always means up to some invertible thing. So featureless for me uh, includes SPG when we're talking about the anomaly theory. All right, so the answer is a uh, no, it's not order two. Um, so there are some extra conditions on the interaction on the wall. Are there any other questions about this example? Yes? So right now these massive uh, sites, uh, they are not SPTs, right? Or well, I said that you should not uh, try to assign SPT labels to okay. either side of the wall because they're indistinguishable. They're just related by the symmetry. Okay, so you want to classify the way. you want to classify like gapless SPTs, is that right? I want to compute the anomaly of the free massless Majorana fermion in two D. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to do that by reducing it to the domain wall here, and so. In the, first, in the first example, it looked like the gravitational anomaly of the domain wall was capturing, was capturing the anomaly. And these new examples show that uh, it's not quite the case. But something like that is close to true. Question? Is it because phi field is a clock changing field? No, phi can be totally pinned for this discussion. Um, the discrepancy between Z16 and Z and Z2. These theories, so I can I can continuously change the sign of the Yukawa interaction. I can just do it at very large mass for the spurion. So these two theories have the same anomaly. Just changing the sign of this inter interaction will not change the anomaly. Yes. So the second lesson is not complete then, or isn't you haven't really given us the? Well, I'm going to tell you the extra conditions. Okay. okay. So to so I'll go into that. So to derive those conditions. Um, we have to think about 
the way I'm going to phrase it is that there are extra symmetries on the domain wall that we need to take care to uh, account for. And, uh, well, what are, the, what are those symmetries? First of all, we have this broken C2 symmetry. Um, it actually does not act on the wall. There's some, uh, some interesting uh, controversy about this in the literature. Some people say that, well, because the domain wall is like between the two vacua, then the symmetry acts on the wall, and others say, no, the symmetry doesn't act on the wall because it doesn't preserve the boundary conditions. Um, I side with that point of view. Like Strictly speaking, the symmetry exchanges the boundary conditions, so it doesn't act on the Hilbert space, this theory. But there is a symmetry associated to it that we'll find. And intuitively, what we want to do is we want to combine our global symmetry with a reflection across the wall. Because the global symmetry will exchange the vacuum on the two sides, and then the reflection symmetry will put them back. So the combination of these two symmetries does act on the wall. But we have to choose our reflection symmetry correctly. In the Majorana, if we choose just the, the usual reflection symmetry for this Majorana field, we actually find that that has the same order 16 anomaly. And uh, when we put these together, we get a symmetry that always acts trivially on the wall. So that's not really good. Actually, we kind of expected that because there's no time reversal anomalies for one these systems, just time reversal. So to get a symmetry, we're going to have to invoke Lorentz symmetry, which is something special to these field theory problems. Um, I'll say a little bit later about what we, what we want to do on the lattice. So uh, a field theory like we've studied, the free Majorana plus the scalar, has a Lorentz symmetry that's generated by spatial rotations and boosts. And boosts are like a change of reference frame. It acts as a hyperbolic rotation. So this matrix, you imagine acting on a vector x t, or, or like uh, yeah, x and t. And uh, a point that is not often appreciated is that only rotations actually have unitary operators associated with them. Because to have a unitary operator on Hilbert space, you have to actually preserve the spatial slice. So rotations preserve the spatial slice, but boosts tilt it. So, so boosts don't have an operator associated with them. But you can sort of, uh, or you can associate an operator to one particular boost, which is a weird one, where this normally real parameter, the rapidity, is set to pi pi. So what does it mean to do this? Um, if you're studying correlation functions uh, in real time, you'll find Usually you find that it is uh, convenient to do uh, I epsilon uh, prescription, where you add a slight positive uh, imaginary time to the real time. And in fact, you can uh, add not just epsilon, but arbitrarily large. You can, you can analytically continue correlation functions to uh, the upper half plane in the time coordinate. Not the space coordinate, uh, but in the time coordinate. And when you do it all the way so that your times are completely imaginary, then we find that it's no longer the Lorentz group that acts, but it's the Euclidean group. And the Euclidean group, um, you get a rotation between uh, space and now imaginary time, where gamma is now imaginary. And well, those don't give you operators either, uh, because they don't preserve the spatial slice, except for one of them. The one that flips the spatial slice all the way over actually preserves the spatial slice, not point-wise, but it preserves it. Um, and that gives you an operator, and when you analytically continue back to real time, you get an operator on Hilbert space, which is known as CPT. Because if you think about flipping the, the spatial slice over, it reverses the time coordinate, and it reverses one of the space coordinates as well. So it's a combination of a time reversal and a parity, and Something else. And uh, that this C here is, uh, well, because there is no canonical T or P or C symmetry, but there is some combination of you choose some T, you choose some P, there will be some C, <coughs> so that CPT is the symmetry. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. So are you trying to emphasize that uh, if I build the symmetry instead of the rings, but uh, uh, Euclidean, there should be the, more, 
there should be a continuous gamma. But uh, if you, if there should be a continuous gamma parameter that you can rotate also between space and time. That's one case. <coughs> In your case right now here is that uh, if you restrict to Lorentz symmetry first, the gamma is only discrete, just as i pi. Yeah, so when we, when we go back to real time, then the only ones, the only operators we have are the Lorentz group and CPT. So Lorentz symmetry actually uh, is a disconnected component that you always have because you can handle it. So if we go to Euclidean, we don't really have a difference between P and T, we just say it's R reflection. And however, because you still consider Lorentz, somehow you need PT. Uh, yeah, the only the only reason why there's PT is because uh, we're doing a, a pi rotation in a space-time plane, and so we reverse both the space direction and the time direction in that plane. So this name CPT is uh, kind of a misnomer. It uh, should be called something else, but for talk, I'll just call it CPT. Does that answer your question? So um, the idea is to choose our CPT, choose this space-time plane correctly, <coughs> so that P is going to reflect the coordinate of the wall. Remember, that's what we wanted to combine with our global symmetry to get a symmetry that actually acts on the wall. But uh, it's kind of interesting because unlike what I was trying to do, which was get a time reversal on the wall, there's a time reversal here. So if I combine CPT with time reversal in the Majorana problem, I actually get a unitary symmetry on the wall. Uh, so the solution to the controversy about what's the symmetry of the domain wall is, does have a symmetry, but it's uh, it's unitary if you started with an anti-unitary symmetry, and it'll also be anti-unitary if you started with a unitary symmetry, just because you need to use CPT to get it. So one can argue on abstract grounds that uh, CPT, in a sense, is always anomaly-free. It's, it's actually unbreakable in the Lorentz invariant system. Um, and combining it with the original T, anom the original T we, get, uh, we will get a domain a anomaly matching theorem. Um, so I'll give you the mathematical theorems and I'll interpret them for you, but I won't uh, go into much detail about proving interpretations. So wait, you're saying it's anomaly free because it's unbreakable? Why, are, why does one apply the other? Um, it's, uh, it's just there's no sense in which you can assign anomaly. So the combination of CPT and T becomes the reflection you mentioned earlier in the slides? Sorry, a little bit louder. The combination of CPT and T becomes reflection you mentioned earlier in the slides? Yeah, it'll be a combined, uh, yeah, it'll be a reflection, and then it reverses time twice, so it's, it's no longer, it's unitary now, and then it does something to the degrees of freedom on the wall. So I'll tell you what it is. Um, first of all, uh, how, do I, how do we work with CPT? Uh, it, the theorem is a little bit annoying because it doesn't give you the operator. It tells you there is an operator, but it doesn't give it to you because boosts don't have an operator associated with them, so you can't just handle it if you continue the boost operator. Of course, that wouldn't make any sense because boosts are unitary, and this i pi boost is anti-unitary, so there's actually no sense in which boosts are unitary that I know. But we know that as long as we preserve Lorentz invariance, the CPT, you know, the CPT symmetry is guaranteed by Lorentz invariance, so it's unbreakable if we never break Lorentz invariance. So the uh, the game is to break all of the accidental symmetries, so all the ones that were not interesting to our problem, so everything but time reversal and Lorentz invariance, and then there will only be one CPT left, and that will be the one we need to use. Um, we can show that it satisfies three, three properties. It squares to one, it commutes with every um, <coughs> unitary symmetry, it, uh, it anti commutes with any anti unitary time reversal on uh, fermions. So these, uh, <coughs> these are interesting properties. I won't I won't show, but I'll just watch them. Okay, so for the for the 2D Majorana, <coughs> it turns out that CPT acts like this. Um, this is actually there's actually no C here. It's actually PT. Um, this is this is you get the gamma one from gamma zero from the T and the gamma one from the P. Uh, 
there's no C. But if you were to combine two of these Majoranas into a direct fermion, then you do that like this, like psi 1 plus I psi 2. Now, this is a two component complex uh, fermion. Then, in order for these to have the same uh, you know, charge under T, you have to also you have to deal with this I. And so you end up having CPT when you just consider uh, two Majoranas as equivalent to a Dirac. It looks like this symmetry looks like CPT for the Dirac. Um, I'll comment that uh, for 3D fermions, the CPT symmetry that you find in the textbook uh, differs from this one by 180 degree rotation. And that's just because they want P to negate all the size coordinates, but that's something uh, that, that works well in three space dimensions because uh, negating all space coordinates is related by a high rotation to just negating one space coordinate. It's cleaner, so in that case you would get the CPT squares to fermion parity, right, because you have an extra high rotation which squares to fermion parity. But it's cleaner, it's cleaner not to do that, at least for dimensional reduction, because we want our CPTs to be compatible through different dimensions. So that's just a little warning. Okay, so let's think about the two times Majorana domain mole. So that was the one where they coupled opposite, oppositely to the spurion, so we had a non-chiral Majorana fermion here, which looked anomaly free. Well, we find that uh, CPT times T, which is the symmetry that's going to act on the wall, acts as minus gamma log times psi. And when you do this uh, chiral fermion problem, you find that the domain wall satisfy this constraint, where uh, gamma 1, so gamma 1 being the associated to x, which is the normal coordinate here, that acts as the uh, chiral, chiral fermion operator uh, for these 1D fermions. And the chirality constraint is that the left movers are positive eigenvalues of gamma 1, and the right movers are negative eigenvalues of gamma 1. So if you look at the symmetry, it says that the unitary symmetry we get acts only on the left movers and not on the right movers. This is good because this is an anomalous unitary symmetry. And in fact, it has an order 8 anomaly. And that order 8 anomaly appears to match uh, the time reversal symmetry we expect for these two Majoranas, which would be 2 times an order 16 anomaly, which would be an order 8 anomaly. So it looks good. It looks like when the gravitational anomaly is not there, then the time reversal anomaly can be captured by this uh, chiral fermion. Questions about that? All right, cool. So um, here's here's the question now. So we've identified two anomalies on the wall that are possible. There's a gravitational anomaly, and there's this anomaly of this unitary Z2 symmetry we get by combining time reversal symmetry with CPT. And that's an order eight anomaly. So now the question is. There are different domain walls can, that we can construct, which will have uh, different k-grab and different k-descent. Um, is there some function that determines the original anomaly in terms of these for all those domain walls? We want it to be the same, it's a universal function that does that. But that's the, that's the question we'll answer in the rest of the talk. <coughs> So um, to talk about this more uh, generally, you know, we've been working with the with the Majorana because it's, it's nice to solve everything. But uh, our goal is to be able to make this work for harder two plus one D systems that we can't understand as easily, and it's harder to compute the anomaly. So we need to work uh, with this mathematical device called coordinate theory that uh, is related to this classification. So the anomalies, I told you an anomaly can be considered the boundary of some SPT. So there's an SPT associated with any anomaly. Um, an SPT, you can consider its partition function on closed space time. <coughs> now the space time can be Euclidean. The partition function is a cobordism invariant of that space time, meaning that if we have this space time, um, x with all the things you need to compute the partition function, S, so that includes like a spin structure, a background cage field, whatever you need. Um, and we have another one, X prime, S prime. 
So these are spacetime manifolds x and x prime of the bulk theory. So for anomaly theory, d spacetime dimensional, but the, these are d plus one dimensional. If we have some d plus two dimensional manifold now, y s prime, where x is one boundary, x prime is the other boundary, and moreover, there's all the same structure on this manifold, so including gauge fields and spin structures and orientations and stuff, such that if you restrict it to either boundary, in this case you get S, and in this case you get S prime, the existence of such a manifold implies that the partition functions of the SPT on X and X prime, the structures S and S prime, are simply equal. So this is a very strong constraint on partition functions. And it actually is going to allow us to classify SPTs completely up to some funny business of uh, whether the SPT is determined by its partition function, which has to do with local versus local models. Yes? So is this a definition, or you can prove it? Which part? Uh, the, the, ident the identification of the two partition functions. Um, this is a statement which is um, uh, strongly believed and partially proven, but relies on um, relies on the unproven assertion that a gap theory unique ground state flows to an invertible TQFT. But it's, uh, I would say it's uh, it's at least a six sigma result. <laughs> But I'd be happy to prove wrong. What is the condition you put on the neutral Right, so if we're studying these fermionic systems with, uh, say, a unitary DQ symmetry for, for simplicity, then these manifolds will have a, a C2 principal bubble as well as a spin structure. So fermions means these are all spin bordisms, um, and then the gauge field is just some principal G bubble. So, I'll give you some examples. Uh, this, so the goal is going to be to understand these manifolds modulo uh, these portisms. The portism being this manifold that has the two ways of Okay, so we define this, this group, the portism group. We'll say its elements are represented by a closed end manifold, some kind of structure, and a map from X to W where W is some space. And we're going to uh, take the quotient by by ordisons. And so this W, we're gonna need this W. So there's gonna be there's gonna be a map from all of our space times to W. That's going to be uh, typically the classifying space of our gauge field. Okay, so very simple example. Uh, this is the so O here means unoriented, or you can think of it as no structure kind of like zero, but it actually stands for orthogonal. Um, the borderism group of zero manifolds. Okay, so zero <coughs> manifolds are just uh, isolated points. Nonetheless, there is non-trivial borderism of isolated points with no structure, because a single point is not the boundary of any one manifold. Only two points is. So it's a C2 group. By the way, I should say the group structure is given by disjoint union of manifolds. You can prove that. It's actually a group. It's inverses. Okay, so more easy facts. Uh, the portism of oriented one manifolds is zero, so uh, you can just have a circle. You can fill it in with a disk, no problem. Um, oriented surfaces, also zero. You have a GHG surface, fill it in with a handle body. Okay, there are some harder ones. Um, spin three manifolds. Can all be filled in by a spin four manifold. Interesting one to ponder. Uh, spin four manifolds, there is an integer invariant roughly given by the signature. The generator of this Bordeson group is this K3 four manifold. Interesting four manifold that is a spin and cannot be filled in by any spin five manifold. In fact, no matter how many disjoint unions you take of it, Cannot fill it in by a spin by Okay, so the one relevant for us is this C8. I told you there is an order 8 anomaly in 1 plus 1D associated to a unitary symmetry. So 
that anomaly of 1 plus 1 D system will be associated to a 2 plus 1 D SPT, and that 2 plus 1 D SPT will have a partition function that pairs with spin three manifolds equipped with a C2 gauge bundle. So, in other words, just a path to P2. And it turns out there's a Z8 of such manifolds, and so there's also a Z8 of, uh, there's at least a Z8 of these phases, but there is a, there's a caveat, which is that although this 3 has Z8, this 4 has Z, and when we go to phases, which is dual to manifolds, we have to shift the Z's down into degree. So this, this Z, what it becomes, it becomes a gravitational turn sign starting with three dimensions. So the group omega upper 3, I should have written it, so omega, so the group of SPTs, which I just write this way, with the 3 on top, because they pair with the one with the 3 below, like the partition function, that this it has the Z8, which is detected by computing it on uh, these space times. It also has, has a Z, which is the gravitational transcendence terms. OK, so we want to understand these uh, a little bit better. And especially, we want to, to do our dimensional reduction, we have to understand how one's different dimension are related. So we're going to construct something called the Smith path. And uh, so this. This Fortism group actually has a nice generator. It's generated by this uh, real projective three space, which is the same as the group manifold SO3. And you can give that SO3 a non trivial C2 gauge field. And it has two spin structures. But either spin structure you choose, it's a generator of the C8. So we're talking about three manifolds with C2 bundles, or maybe n manifolds with C2 bundles. Uh, any such bundle, there's an associated line bundle because you can you can uh, you can get gluing gluing functions for a line bundle using the Z2. Where whenever you have a holonomy that's not trivial in the Z2 group, the line gets reflected. So, for instance, like the Mobius band corresponds to the non-trivial Z2 bundle on the circle. Okay, so that's good. That's a real vector bundle, a real line bundle. We can take a generic smooth section of this line bundle. So you should, you should think about this as representation as corresponding to the representation of the order parameter of the spur down. The, we take the zero set of a generic smooth section of this bundle. That's, uh, you think about that, is that's where our spurion vanishes. That's, uh, that two manifold is, giving, is representing the domain wall, but now in the SPT phase. So if you think about uh, this RP3, you can actually draw it. You can draw it as a three-dimensional ball where on the boundary you identify antipodal points. So this blue line is actually a circle. This point identifies with that point. And so that gives us a contour gamma, which is the contour that detects the non-trivial uh, C2 bundle, which means that if we have our C2H field A, the integral is 1 mod 2 rather than 0 mod 2. And if you, if you associate the bundle to this and choose just the sort of obvious section that is like linear along this contour, then uh, the zero set is on this thing, which looks like a disk, but it's not a disk because the boundary points are antipodally identified. It's actually a real projected plane, which is interesting. It's non-orientable. So the domain wall of a, of a unitary symmetry could be non-orientable. Um, but it seems uh, that if we choose different sections, we get very different, uh, very different looking zero sets. So um, we could get surfaces of a higher genus. You know, we can get like little handles coming out of here, that's changing that section a little bit. Uh, so is, is there anything invariant? Well, actually, the vortism of this zero zero set, the vortism class of this zero set, is invariant, which is really cool. Um, if you have two sections, you can consider adding an extra coordinate. So you take our space x where so I just replace RP3 with x because this is totally general. You take x, you add an extra coordinate that goes from 0 to 1. You create, you extend everything that was on x to this cylinder, what looks like a cylinder. Then you use this coordinate to get a section which linearly interpolates from one section to the other. So you have one section over 0 and the other section over 1. You just linearly interpolate. That's a section, but it might not be generic. Well, it's OK. You can perturb it to be generic. 
And once you do so, its zero set is manifold. And in fact, it's a bordism between the two zero sets. Right? Boundary on one side is the zero set of S0. You know, the first section is boundary on the other side. The cylinder is the zero of that one. So it looks like this. Here's the zero set. Here's some other zero set. The zero set in between you know, may look weird, but uh, it certainly has our two zero sets as its boundary. So it's good. This means we get a map of borders and groups. And you can, you can deal with the structure. So I told you that it's, it's typically unorientable, which means that uh, you know, we, want, we want to do something with the spin structure. The spin structure here is not going to restrict to a spin structure on the zero set. It's not even orientable. But actually, you can do a nice trick. You can take the spin transition functions, and the places where it's non-orientable are places where it's uh, rotating in the normal and a tangent direction. So you can rotate back, and you can actually choose a gauge so it looks like you're doing CPTs along the domain wall. And you figure out what structure you get. It's a pin plus structure of the zero set. And these pin plus structures correspond to fermions with a time reversal symmetry t squared equals 1, which is exactly what we would expect from the three properties I told you about CPT. So the physical interpretation checks out so far, and we conclude we got homomorphism of groups um, from this bordism group to this bordism group. So it's great. It relates, uh, it relates uh, anomalies. This, this is a group that encodes anomalies of the z2 unitary symmetries of n minus 1 dimensions to anomalies on the wall, n minus 2 dimensional thing, t squared equals 1. <coughs> get from CPT combined with the unitary T2 symmetry. Okay, so this there's a theorem um, which actually I could not find the uh, original reference for this theorem. In, in Gilkey's book on uh, spherical space forms, he attributes this theorem to Smith, but uh, doesn't give a reference. He's also studying a different order group. So um, in the paper, we provide proof of the theorem some generalizations. So uh, I guess I does. <laughs> okay, so the theorem though, uh, which Smith proved, is that the following sequence is exact. And so what this means is that uh, this group is a quotient of this group by this group. Okay, so let's prove that. First of all, we need to show that this map is injective. Well, that's pretty clear. If you have a spin n manifold, you give it the trivial Z2 bundle, that's this map. Clearly injective. Okay, then we need surjectivity here. So to do that, we actually construct an inverse to this map, a right inverse, so it's split exact. Um, so if you have a pin minus n minus 1 manifold, so something here, you can form, just like we formed the, uh, you know, it has its orientation bundle, which is the Z2 bundle. We can associate a line bundle to that, but we can also associate a circle bundle to it by the same way where you reflect the circle just where you were to reflect the line. So that's, you can check, it's a closed uh, spin n manifold, and it has a Z2 bundle just giving by uh, pulling back the orientation bundle. And you can find very easily the, the image of that manifold under, the, under this map, the Smith map, is uh, what you started with. So that's surjectivity and also splitness. Have to be careful with the structure the whole time that you can do it. Okay, the interesting part of the theorem is the exactness in the middle. So um, that's there's two halves to that. The first half is that if you take your spin n manifold, give it a trivial Z2 bundle, and then do the Smith map, which means looks at look at the zero set of the generic section of that Z2 bundle, you should get zero. Well, that's because if you have a trivial Z2 bundle, you can choose a generic section with no zero set. And so you can arrange things so that the image of this map is just zero, and you're allowed to choose any section you want as long as you make sure that it's zero set is a manifold, because we know we have borders and variance between different sections. So that's pretty easy. Uh, the other direction is kind of cool. You have to show that uh, if you have a spin n manifold with a Z2 bundle, such that the zero set of the generic section of that Z2 bundle can be filled in as a pin minus manifold, then 
the big manifold can also be filled in. So here is the picture of that. So our, hopefully I can explain this. So this, this purple disk is representing our spin and manifold. This line along the disk is the zero set of the generic section of the Z2 module. We know that that can be filled in by a pin minus manifold. So that's this um, purple surface that comes out here, right? So that, we've taken our surface, and now it looks like this, right? So it's kind of like T-shaped where the, the domain wall is filled in, but the surface is still open. Well, we want to get a vortism of, of this piece, of the big piece, so what we do is we thicken the vortism of the domain wall, and we use the orientation line to do that. So we thicken it by the orientation line, we to take like, you know, minus one to one in every fiber of the orientation line. So we get a manifold with boundary, and now when we stick that to our spin and manifold, um, we got rid of the Z2 bundle. So you can see now the Z2 bundle extends everywhere, and on the other side of the vortism, so now it's like the sandwich, so on the outside of the sandwich, there's no more domain wall. So we've got rid of the domain wall. Which means that we're in the image of this map, right? Because that was the map that told us um, we take a spin and manifold and consider the trivial Z2 bundle. So that's the proof of the Smith Ice model. Any questions about that? Yes? Uh, so does this only hold for the Z2 group? Like if you get, if you take ZK? I'm glad you asked. We'll get to that. Yes. So first, before we get to fancier groups, uh, let me interpret this for you and say that we needed we needed a different Z2 actually, right? Because we wanted to study time reversal Z2s in core, right? Not uh, unitary Z2s, 3D. Okay, so if you dualize this short exact sequence, get some other exact sequence. I've cracked, but it's zero here. But there, there is a zero there, uh, so this map is subjective. Um, so the physical interpretation of this is that. We have a fermionic system with a unitary Z2 symmetry, so its anomaly is here. If the gravitational anomaly is trivial, which means that the map to here is zero of that anomaly class, then you're in the image of this map. Being in the image of this map means that the system may be completely disordered once you break the Z2. So it's possible to reduce the theory to the domain wall. The domain wall has an associated anti-unitary symmetry squaring to one that we get combining U with CPT. Its anomaly lives here, the image of that anomaly has to be the anomaly of the bigger theory. So this uh, exact sequence gives you the anomaly matching for the domain wall in this special case. So for n equals 3, for instance, we get this nice result that uh, you have this group, this z8 times z that I wrote here. If you don't have any gravitational anomaly, then you can reduce to the wall, and the wall is a uh, so we're talking about a, now an anomaly of a 1 plus 1D system. And so the wall will be a 0 plus 1D system. We'll find some number of Meyer mod zero modes there. And that number will be uh, this quantity mod 8 identified in the big CPU group. So we get, uh, we get zero modes off, uh, Meyer mod zero modes on the wall for these Z2 anomalies. It's also related to the fact that the vortex of the people's IV finds a Meyer mod zero mode because that gives you a way of constructing generators on the So quickly trying to do the twisted version, give you the answer for the Majorana. So with the prob for the problem with the Majorana is we need a Smith map for pin plus. Uh, pin plus corresponds to t squared equals minus 1 to the f. Um, a pin plus structure, so yeah, the most general space times uh, for systems with the symmetry, fermionic systems with the symmetry is our pin plus uh, manifolds, pin plus manifolds, you can think of it as it has a spin structure, but not on the tangent bundle, Tx, but uh, on this closely related bundle, Tx plus rho, where rho is uh, three copies of the orientation line. So, three copies of the orientation line, equivalently, we can think of this, if we have our, if we think about time reversal as associated with the C2 gauge field, which is the orientation bundle, then that C2 gauge field, um, we can pull back a bundle, a universal bundle, which is associated to three times the sign representation. So we write 
So we write these uh, twisted vortices groups this way, where you have whatever space here, usually classifying space, and then you have some vector bundle over the classifying space. This means that we get a spin structure on Tx plus the pullback of that bundle by A. So in this case, this is just uh, definition shuffling. But the pin plus vortices group that we're interested in is this twisted spin guy. Okay, very good. So um, we can define the generalized uh, Z2 Smith map actually for any structure, doesn't matter. We find that uh, in Bordism, you go down a dimension because you go to the domain wall. The number of twists, so for Z2, there's only one representation, with the sign, which is the sign representation. So the twist is just n times the sign representation. And when you go down a dimension, um, you add one more sign representation. Pretty simple. Um, if the structure is spin, then uh, you actually get a fourfold periodicity, which is kind of cool, uh, because four times the sign representation actually admits a universal spin structure. So these groups are the same, which is actually what we need, because we want to go from an anomaly of a 2 plus 1d system with t squared equals minus 1 dF. Here, we want to go to something here with a unitary square into 1, well, the Smith map gives us a naively this twisted thing. Luckily, they're equal. So we can use the periodicity. Um, so this is the new theorem that we proved. So we prove uh, that this sequence is exact. Um, so basically, you just figure out which parts of the other argument uh, still work. Not all of them do. In particular, we lose, we lose both injectivity here and surjectivity here. So we don't have the zeros on the end anymore. And that actually corresponds to our, our lessons. Uh, so physically, what we've done is, uh, you know, it's the same physical interpretation. If the anomaly um, doesn't have any gravitational part, but your S can be any structure. So this also includes the pure G anomalies that I mentioned before. So if you don't have any of those, any pure G anomaly, G asymmetry doesn't participate in the symmetry breaking. Um, and you don't have any uh, gravitational anomaly, then you're in the kernel of this map, then the domain wall has an anomaly here, and the big anomaly is in the image of that, or is the image of the class of the anomaly the domain wall, which there could be many pre-images. And the fact that there are many pre-images is the fact that we lost injectivity here. Moreover, we lost surjectivity here, which means that some gravitational anomalies are actually not out of the symmetry, which is intuitively clear, like you can't have, a, it's hard to have a turn number with the time reversal of for instance. Sorry, the M here is arbitrary? M, M is arbitrary. Yeah. Positive. Yeah. yeah, M is an integer, arbitrary. Well, I, I suppose a, a lot of the tools are, I don't know, it can be a, it could be zero. For zero, you get the usual Smith map. More questions? So for yeah. bosons, it works. Yeah, so oh, S, for, if you want to do bosons, S should just be an orientation. It's all good. It'll get a less interesting sequence. But, so, yeah, it works. I guess the, the, the previous one, like map from S O to O, mm -hmm. that also works. Yeah, yeah, that would be happy. Yeah. Right, yeah, it's like time reversal. Yeah, S can really be any structure for this theorem, which is one of the great things about it. Okay, so the answer to our question of whether there was this function um, that captures the bulk anomaly in terms of the anomaly of the domain wall is yes. So there is such a function. Even better, the Smith map tells us it's a linear function, which we love because we can just uh, compute a couple points on this line and draw the line through them. It turns out the line is this. Uh, so, for instance, going back to our example of two Majoranas where we changed the signs of the Yukawa couplings, if they're both positive, remember we got uh, two right movers and uh, no left movers. So uh, k grab was two and k descent was zero. So two minus zero is two mod 16. Good. Um, if they're both negative, then we get two left movers, right? But the two left movers have both k grab is minus two and k descent is plus two. And minus 2 plus 4 is 2 mod 16, so we're good again. Um, if they have opposite sign, then there's no k grab, 
but there's one left mover, so k descent is one, or is <coughs> one. Anyway, okay, <laughs> we got two. We got two mod sixteen if we uh, get all our signs correct. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that formula. Um, so there are a number of applications that I don't have time to really talk about, but you can ask me about later. Three fermions we just had as like a motivating example to try to like guide us so we don't get confused so we can compute everything. But there are lots of other interesting uh, anomalies we want to compute in plus one dimension, including DQFTs with time reversal symmetry, um, theories like QCD3, and especially certain sigma models. And there are a bunch of conjectural RG flows between these theories. So uh, testing the anomalies is one way to test your RG flows. Of course, it's a very weak one, but it better work. And uh, the one that we were confused about for a while was this 2 plus 1 DCB1 model, where the skirmion carries fermion parity. So it was an ambiguity. You can, you can flow to this theory from either two or six complex fermions. So the time reversal symmetry seems to be either four or minus four, but uh, we did it carefully. And it's four in the two case and, and minus four in the six case, even though they look like the same theory, they have slightly different symmetry reactions, different models. Okay, so there's a story there. We also did the Z mod N version. And the Z mod N version is cool because um, think about like Z mod three. There's, there's no way to get a symmetry on the domain wall, but you can get a symmetry on uh, the vortex, where you have, where you, when you break the symmetry, you get you get three backbone, and you can combine the Z three symmetry with a two pi over three rotation. Um, rotations actually are just uh, you know multiple CPDs put together, so we do the same thing, and we find that uh, there's a version of the Smith map, um, which is based on any representation of the group. Just choose whatever representation that corresponds to the representation of your spurions or your order parameters. And so here you have two order parameters. You go to a vortex, which is co-dimension two, and there's an interesting kernel of this map. Uh, first of all, the sequence is exact, so we get the same thing. Where if, where if you're in the so this is the vortism, but if we if we had the if we were in the dual picture, then the maps go like this. So if you're in the kernel of this map then you're in the image of this map, and the interpretation is that you reduce the calculation of the anomaly to the domain wall. Uh, this, this n, this is a typo, so this n should be a k. It's, it's not related to the dimension at all. This oh. case is still split? Um, no, it's not split. And the other one isn't either. Yeah, so we put that as well. I mean, the not splitting is the fact that uh, Kind of that. There's there's no way for a Z16 to split a Z times Z, right? So that yeah, you can't split. Okay, so since S was arbitrary, this is actually uh, maybe even stronger than it looks, because you can have lots of other symmetries that don't participate in the symmetry breaking, but nonetheless participate in the anomaly. They have mixed anomalies, and so actually this this gets us to dimensional reduction for any finite abelian group, and. I think this means for all Lie groups because we can just uh, take a large enough subgroup with the maximal torus and then work with that. So actually, this, uh, these two theorems allow you to reduce most of the anomaly computations we're interested in. Um, sometimes all the way down to quantum mechanics, and then you just have to find a projective representation. So it makes things a lot easier. So here's the summary. Um, we argued that symmetry breaking domain walls carry remnants of the global symmetry. We used Lorentz invariance in the CPT theorem. Uh, CPT had to act in a certain way for the anomaly matching to work. It's a new property of CPT. Um, we proved a theorem that computes the anomaly matching condition. And uh, these Smith theorems were, have been uh, extended uh, to finite field groups. So the remaining questions are. How do you actually define the CPT operator? This would be really cool. It's a symmetry. The operator you always have is a symmetry, so it should be, uh, I don't know, it should be something uh, maybe obvious, I don't know. Um, another question is, is there a version of these theorems for, say, for K-theory, which would allow us to compute the index of uh, elliptic operators by similar dimensional reduction? This would be really useful 
because uh, you know there are all these indices that uh, that we're often computing to figure out like what do the vortices and skirmions and monopoles look like, and it would be nice also to do dimensional reduction for those. And I think probably most uh, most perplexing is how how can this all work on the lattice? There's no Lorentz invariance, so there's we can't really invoke the CPT theorem, but it does seem like something like this is true. Um, there's this uh, crystalline equivalence principle that Dominic Elsa and I found about the classification of crystalline SPTs uh, ends up being, in, in certain ways, isomorphic to the classification of ordinary internal symmetry SPTs. And the structure of that uh, you know, that, that can be sort of proven if you also assume Lorentz invariance. So if you assume that uh, the, the crystalline symmetries are implemented by uh, Lorentz times an internal symmetry, then that internal symmetry is what's giving you the equivalence principle. But it should be a lattice-level way to do it, especially since we want to study the domain walls on the lattice. And uh, I have a question I just don't know how to answer this. How do you understand the kernels of these maps? These are quite interesting maps. You know, it's, it took a spin n manifold or an S n manifold, gave it a C2 bundle with a twisted structure. So sometimes you can fill in the manifold by using twist. So that's quite interesting. I don't know how that happens. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Ryan, for a wonderful talk. Yeah. Any questions? For this, uh, the three case, uh, could you study some example with the vertex? Um, uh, yeah, th there are some examples that you, that you can construct. Um, the Azelian pink ones give you some examples where this is part of like the, the magnetic center group. So then you have a mixed anomaly between um, this Z3 subgroup of the magnetic cube one and the SO3 symmetry, and you'll find a uh, spin a half there. So that's your projective representation. So that's where S is taken to be um, SO3 now. Any questions? No, that's me. Next one is the 10 again. <laughs>